it's just funny how human beings, it doesn't matter if you're talking about selling shoes like Zappos, selling calligraphy or selling a new religion. People are so predictable. You know, we all try to reinvent the way we communicate, but it's just there really are principles to attracting attention and driving emotion to hyping things up. Hey there, I'm Maya De Leon, and my mission is to help creatives like you translate what you love to do into a highly profitable income. I'm a mom of three who began as a lettering artist and grew it into a six-figure business. If I made it possible, so can you. Every week, we'll dive deep into topics like building your confidence, getting comfortable talking about money, and nurturing your passion while juggling life and family. So if you're an ambitious creative who wants to craft the life you love, get cozy, feel at home, and listen to The Confident Creator Show. Michael F. Shine is the founder and president of Microfame Media, a marketing agency that specializes in making idea-based companies famous in their fields. Some of his clients include eBay, Magento, University of Pennsylvania, LinkedIn, Citrix, and many others. His writing has appeared in Fortune, Forbes, Psychology Today, and Huffington Post. And he is a speaker for international audience spanning from northeastern United States to the southeastern coast of China. And he is the author of the book, The Hype Handbook, 12 Indispensable Success Secrets from the World's Greatest Propagandists, Self-Promoters, Cult Leaders, Mischief Makers, and Boundary Breakers. And today we are going to talk about how artists and creatives can benefit from building the hype that they need to promote their art, brand, products, and services. And by hype, I mean creating a cult-like following so you can draw a lot of attention to your work and your brand and build a strong presence online. So welcome to the show, Michael F. Shine. (laughs) That was quite the introduction. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah, thank you so much for coming to the show. And I'm glad that our common friend Miriam Shulman introduced us to each other because I know there's so much value to learn from what we will talk about today. So I'm super, super excited. Me too. Yeah. And you know what's funny? (laughs) Because I glanced at your book the first time I looked at it. When I saw it, I was like, wow, this is really something. Is this something that I wanted to talk about in the podcast? So I had to read it again and get to it so I can understand the context. And when I did, it was amazing, like brilliant. Like, oh, yeah, this makes sense. This makes so much sense because you have used some trigger words that will really get people, you know, standing up and paying attention And then you deliver the context in a way that is more digestible. And that is coming from someone who has been, you know, who's having a hard time reading books. I did not grow up reading books, so it's quite challenging for me. So. (laughs) Well, thank you. That's a big compliment. I mean, I I know full well that the hype has a negative connotation. And I, I think all of us want to see ourselves as good people, right? Like that we that we treat people nicely and that we you know, play by the rules and that our work stands on its own. I guess what I'm committed to is really seeing the world the way it is, not how it should be. And, and seeing if we can sort of use that understanding of how the world really works and how human nature really works to get what we want out of life, but to do so ethically and in a way that makes people's lives better. So that's really, that, that's really my, my goal in, in the work I do and the book I wrote. Mm, yeah. So is that the reason why you have chosen the word hype as the title of the book? Yeah, that that's one reason. Um, on one hand, I wanted to sort of take back a word that a lot of people think of as negative. But also, you know, not in every community is, is hype considered a bad thing. So so in hip hop, which is um, a community that's that's done really um, that, that's done a really, really good job at attracting attention around themselves over the last couple of decades being a hype man is a positive i, I there, there was always a position in in a in a rap group especially in the 80s called the hype man and that person was an official member of the group and they were in charge with, of getting the crowd riled up and getting people emotional and getting attention 
And you always hear that world, word hype in hip hop. And I think it's because people in the world of hip hop tend to be very clear eyed. A lot of times, especially in the past, they came from disadvantaged circumstances. So they didn't have the luxury to say, well, I'm going to go get my marketing degree and, you know, I'll learn you know, the formal, the, the, P, the three P's and then go to an advertising agency and hire a marketing firm and get a PR person. It was, what can we do with the tools we have at our disposal and what we know about human nature to attract attention and get people emotional? And, and yeah, it's, it's sort of the luxury of people who aren't on the outside to do things the official way. So I've always liked those outsiders. And we're all kind of outsiders now with the pandemic and with the way the world is changing. You know, none of us have a clear path anymore. So I think hype is extremely important to familiarize yourself with. That is so, so true. And you know what? I didn't actually know that it has a negative connotation. I actually learned about <laughs> the word hype because of the social media, the trending, you know, all of those words, because I did yeah. not grow up with all of these uh, jargons and stuff that I have been hearing today in these days. Right. <laughs> it's funny like that. So when you mentioned about it being a negative connotation, I was like surprised and uh -huh. didn't actually know, but I'm pretty sure a lot of my audience could relate to that, that hype has a negative connotation to other people. And I'm glad that you have explained why you used it as a title of the book. It's really interesting. Now, we are, you mentioned we are in the middle of the, of a pandemic as of this recording. So why do you think, why do you think mastering hype is especially, you know, for artists and creatives can be useful in this current historical moment? So, and I, I feel like we, many of us, especially people my age, 43 years old, around my age, grew up, we were the last generation to, to have this feeling that if you did the right thing and played by the rules, you could at least get a pretty good job. Um, and if you were an artist, you know, it's funny, I'm more interested in artists than I am in business people, even though I own an agency, because <laughs> I, 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 you know, I write fiction, I used to play in bands. And I, I got a lot of my tactics from artists, people like Andy Warhol, and, and, you know, things like that. And I think that the art world has become so market oriented recently that people are treating art like a business. They're, they're okay, you've got to go to the right galleries and get noticed by the right agent and move up the ranks, and then you can be Jeff Koons or whatever. And I think that all of those certainties are breaking down. The pandemic is just one piece of it. That was the biggest shock after years of warnings that that we that we've had so far but you know there's climate crisis there's artificial intelligence we're in a time of great transition things are really changing a lot so if you're planning to follow the rules and just do things the normal way and learn internet marketing and social media marketing and landing pages and think that you're going to just get an audience for your art or your business or whatever maybe you will but you see what happens when you have firm plans. A pandemic can happen. And I think change like that is going to be the norm, not, not the exception. So I think we have to get above all this thing that I'm calling hype, the people that I talk about in the book, everyone from artists like Andy Warhol, who were really iconoclastic to really bad people like cult leaders and propaganda artists to really good people like, um, or, or at least people who contribute to society like Richard Branson or Martin Luther King, what they all have in common is that they're extremely flexible. They look at the raw material of the world around them. And instead of complaining about it, they say, how can we turn all of these obstacles into opportunities to get attention? How do we turn our weaknesses into strengths? So I think if you're not, if you're constantly saying to yourself, it shouldn't be this way, then you're at a disadvantage because the world is how it is. So you can either accept it or, or be sad that things aren't as perfect as you'd like them to be. 
That is so, so true. And I think, I think you mentioned a very important detail and something that I wanted to highlight. You mentioned turning obstacles into opportunities. And especially these days, we are in the middle of a pandemic and a lot of people are complaining being cooped up at home. (laughs) Whereas, you know, we still, there's still a lot of things to be thankful for. We have the internet, we have Netflix, we have everything. We can still make money online. Remember, I don't know, during the old times when people have been hit by what? The Spanish flu and all of those other nasty stuff. Yeah, you were out of work. You know? Yeah, yeah exactly. they, they don't have what we have right now. So there's still a lot of uh, things to be th- uh, thankful for. And what- Also, um, especially in the art world, this might be a little bit off topic from, from the hype thing. And listen, I, I you know... This pandemic has sucked. I mean, it hasn't been good for anyone. Uh, yeah. it, it, it's been a drag. There's been a lot of death. There's been a lot of financial loss. It's it's a bad thing. However, when I hear people, especially artists, complaining that they can't go out and that they're stuck inside and this and that, part of me can't help but think, you know, weren't you the same person complaining that you didn't have enough time to do your art, that you didn't have enough alone time with your easel or your, or your sketch pad? True. You know, there's this concept. You know, Ryan Holiday, who is a guy that uh, a thinker that I like, uh, and he learned this from his mentor, Robert Greene. They talk about this thing, alive time versus dead time. And and I didn't come up with this, obviously. But the idea is that even let's say, you know, let's say you're in prison or you're stuck inside with a pandemic. You can make that dead time. You can just bemoan your fate and let that time pass. Or you can turn it into a lifetime if you never got the chance to write or read or think or paint or draw. This is the perfect time for that. So, yeah, I would encourage people to try to find a live time in the dead time if they can. Yes, that is really amazing. So thanks for sharing that. (laughs) I love that concept, turning a a dead time into a lifetime. All right, did I get it right? (laughs) Yeah, and and again, I mean, Ryan Holiday and Robert Greene talk about this a lot, but it's just something that I heard from from them once and i just i've I've thought about it a lot and i think it's really um for in this pandemic um as we hopefully fingers crossed reach the light at the end of the tunnel i know it's it's worth thinking about in general yes yes that is so so true and this is the time to be reflecting on a lot of things instead of just complaining and doing actually putting everything in action thinking of different strategies and how you can make the most out out of it all. Because if you're listening to this podcast, you're still considered lucky, right? Not all of us. At the same time, at the same time, I don't want to minimize how hard this has been. Yes, we are not minimizing it. We're just talking about how there are still opportunities in the middle of this chaos. Right, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So we moved away from the book a little bit. So let's go back to your book. Let's go back to your book. I want to talk about the book because it's really amazing and it's interesting. And if our listeners could only use, I know there are 12 hype strategies in the book. So you guys, you have to really get the book so that you can learn all all these 12 strategies. If they can use they can use one, just one or maybe two <laughs> hype strategies in the in the book. Which one or which two of them will you uh, recommend them to use and why? I would say that they're best used, obviously, in combination. But there is one strategy that in some ways all of the other strategies are built on that that really the other strategies can't exist without. And it's the strategy I call make war, not love. And it's the idea that people are attracted to being against something rather than being for something. And this sounds really negative to people, but it doesn't have to be. So so the idea is that for various reasons in, in, in our in our evolution, really, we are attracted to conflict. We're attracted to being against people we perceive not to be like us. And that can manifest itself in really nasty ways like racism and nationalism. But it can also manifest itself as being against an idea or set of ideas. And we see that a lot in art, right? Like what what characterizes art? 
Art is at its most interesting when a new young generation comes in and says everything that came before us is garbage and obsolete and we're going to do something new, right? So you had like, you had just very classical styles of art and then you had the impressionists who came out and said, you know, painting everything, you know, perfectly especially in the age of photography, is, is useless. It, it's ridiculous. It serves no purpose. What you want to do is paint impressions of what you see, how the eye takes things in. And that was considered crazy. Like, what is that? That was so revolutionary. And, and yet those people constantly hammered at the old generation. And as a result, the people who loved impressionism, loved impressionism. It was this cult, this clan, you know? The, the dealers who were for impressionism just spread the word by and large. And then those people got old and I'm going to get the order wrong. Uh, and, and, but you know, at a certain point the cubists came out and they said, painting things that are real life is useless. We just went through world war one and you're going to paint beautiful pictures of cafes. That's horrible. That's ridiculous. Right. And then that those people got old. And then the abstract expressionists at one point came out and they were so revolutionary, splattering paint on canvases. And then at a certain point, they were the establishment. Andy Warhol came out and he was painting. He kind of came full circle. He was painting lifelike renditions of soup cans and talking about how the abstract expressionists, they, suddenly they looked out obsolete and old. And each of these movements had... Um, really diehard followers. And from what I know about visual art, I'm not a visual artist, but I'm interested in it. Again, with the market of art, people are out there doing great art, but they're just sort of doing versions of, of, of what happened in the past. And some of, some of it's really offensive, you know, and in a good way, you know, they, they, they paint or, or, or I don't know about a good way, but they, it's not that the art is safe. I mean, I go into places, there's all kinds of grotesque figures and, you know, um, genitalia and whatever else they're painting right but it's not shocking anyone because they don't stand against anything they're just painting versions of what's come before mm -hmm. people did that stuff in the 50s with different media so i think it's really important to say i'm going to draw a line in the sand not so much this is what i'm doing and this is why my stuff is great but this is what i'm against it's like kill your idols this is why everything that came before me is obsolete and ridiculous and nothing attracts people like that that is extremely powerful especially in art but really in any field yes yeah, true and art is ever developing right it is right. like it's similar there was actually you mentioned about uh the old art and then the new art <laughs> because there has been a discussion i think years ago about calligraphy and then the modern calligraphy because the the, right. uh, the old calligraphy style you know has a certain distinct um style that right. is that must be followed there are certain rules that must be followed and uh, those who are aspiring to be calligraphers must not deviate from those rules but then there's the modern yeah. calligraphy and then there was a heated debate about uh, modern calligraphy not being the real calligraphy and all of that stuff but art is ever evolving and it's changing and we are adapting to it so all of these stuff are yes might might have changed from long and years ago but it's still art right it doesn't mean that they're but, but no that's, longer but art. that's even better not to interrupt but i love what you're saying because i feel like this calligraphy thing I, i'd love to hear from you are these new calligraphers attracting attention? Because I know in visual art, like on the New York scene, my impression, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that, yeah, people are doing art and it's fine, but it just comes across as a little bit boring and a little bit flat because people are just doing art. They're not taking a stand against anything. Yeah. It sounds like these cal new calligraphers are. So how has that played out? Have these new calligraphers <laughs> attracted a lot of attention? Well, yeah, that is why modern calligraphy is has become a big thing because people think they're fun and something new to do. You mean, exactly. I mean, diverting from the old strategy, the old style of doing calligraphy and doing more like um, the bounces, all of those. They don't have those. I don't know if they have those because I didn't know calligraphy. I know hand lettering, but those bounces, it makes it more fun and exciting to look at calligraphy in such a different way. And it's really exciting. And then there's the, what do, what do you call that? The acrylic pour these days. <laughs> so you have abstract, 
And then there is the acrylic pour where, where you'll just, you know, get a canvas and then pour different colors of acrylic and form an artwork from that. And that is like how art has evolved really in all of those years, right? It's very exciting. And it sounds like these new calligraphers are really practicing excellent hype mm -hmm. in a way that some other artists are not. It did. It did really get hyped for, you know, right. quite this last couple of years. And so these days, modern calligraphy courses has been one of the most um, trending courses online. And people are buying those courses because they wanted to learn it. So it's an interesting. It, it's just funny how human beings, it doesn't matter if you're talking about selling shoes like Zappos, selling calligraphy or selling a new religion. Mm -hmm. People are so predictable. You know, we all try to <laughs> reinvent the way we communicate, but it's just there really are principles to attracting attention and driving emotion to hyping things up. Yes, yes, that is so, so true. Oh, my goodness. And you also mentioned about having, I read in the book, you mentioned about having a common enemy, right? Yeah, this, this is exactly what I'm talking yes, about, right? It's like the old calligraphers or the common enemy, right? Yes. Yeah. And that is how you build the cult-like following. When you right. have that army of people who are backing you up and who believes in your ideals, like, yeah, I want calligraphy, but I want this modern calligraphy as opposed to the old calligraphy. Well, to the calligraphers out there, we are not <laughs> trying to minimize uh, whatever it is that you're doing. We're just setting an example. So don't take offense, really. OK, let's be objective out here. <laughs> you know, we all want to be liked, or at least most of us do. So usually there is a whole breed of people who like if they're doing something new and they get a bad review, like let's say using the calligraphy example, which I'm only just learning about from you, but someone does this new calligraphy and presents it and some old calligraphy, some old art critic or calligraphy critic, if that even exists, says this is just frivolous and stupid and ridiculous. Many of us would be just sad and crawl into a hole. Others of us would change what we're doing to fit in. The best thing to do would be to invite that criticism, ridicule the critic, you know, like the best thing you can do to spread a religion is to persecute it. I mean, the martyr, there's a reason the martyrs in Christianity are saints, because they did more than anybody else to make that religion popular. Like if the Romans had really wanted to eradicate Christianity, they should have just ignored it. It would have faded away. But by persecuting people and by crucifying people and whipping people and feeding them to lions, they made it into this. They bound the people together. You know what I mean? They turned them into fanatics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Turning them into fanatics. Yes. That's yeah. how basically Apple did all of this, like the cult like following that Apple has. It's basically anti PC. Yeah, right. exactly. Right. <laughs> that, that is exactly it. And that's the reason why no matter how pricey the Apple products are, people are still buying it. That is a great example of what you were talking about. So, yeah, no one looks at Dell and they're like, I no one's going to put a Dell bumper sticker on their car. You yeah. buy it because it's cheap and it works. <laughs> But those Apple ads where they had, do you remember the, 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 the Apple ads where they had Justin Long, who was the hip Mac guy? And then they had <laughs> John Hodgman was like the stodgy, fat, like corporate guy with the short tie and everything. The idea was that it wasn't just against PCs. It was against corporate conformity. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. As represented by the PC. Now, the dirty little trick is that Apple is just as big as corporate. It, it was the most valuable company in the world at one point. You can't get more corporate than Apple, yeah. you know? <laughs> but they really created this perception of being anti-corporate conformity. And as a result, they created this cult. So that's a great example. Yep. Yep. So, so true. And I know that because I had a business coach who talked about that, like having a common enemy and having an army of followers behind you who believe in your ideals. That is also how you build your own micro celebrity status. Without right. a doubt. Not yeah. Even a question. Yep. OK, so that was a very interesting topic. <laughs> 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 and I wish we have more time, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wish we have more time. But okay, I know I'm going to let you go at some point. But it, it, 
Is there anything <laughs> okay. in particular that you are working on right now that you're most excited about? And can you tell us a little bit more about it? Is there any other book coming? There will be. Um, this book is not that old. It's only a couple of months old. So I am promoting it right now, which has been really great. It's, it's generated a bit of hype on its own, you know, uh-huh. on its own. So that's been exciting. You know, it's funny. I, I, um, I own a marketing agency, much of it based on these concepts. And I love working with um, clients. Uh, you know, some of the clients you mentioned, big companies, consultants, things like that. And I'll, I'll always continue to do that. But something I'm really excited about now is that I have so many interests outside of simply running marketing campaigns. I'm interested in art. I'm interested in fiction. I'm interested in, you know, people with great ideas and giving large numbers of people um, the ability to attract attention around their good ideas. I'm interested in working with people you know, just regular people inside big companies, not just helping promote the company, but giving people the skills to advocate for themselves. So my, I've been working on a, a series of initiatives that have to do with that. So I'm doing a work, a series of online workshops right now to get the, these hype strategies out to more people. I'm beginning to um, finally, now that the uh, world is opening up, I'm, I'm speaking again on these topics, which is extremely exciting because I can talk to large audiences and sort of, you know, share these concepts with them. I'm doing some what they call intact work groups. So going into companies and instead of actually implementing the marketing campaigns for the brand, working with the people inside the organization to give them a hype mindset, a benevolent sort of positive hype mindset. Because my whole thing is that, you know, a lot of these strategies or this mindset, even though no, there's nothing immoral about it, it often on balance comes more easily to immoral people because they tend to see the world as it really is rather than letting their emotions get in the way. And I think that's a tragedy because those people use these psycho- this, this psychology to do a lot of harm. And so I've gotten really excited about putting these tools in as many hands of uh, the hands of as many good people as possible, doing great work. Um, and, and, and that, that, that's just been really fun and, and meaningful. Um, and I love talking to artists because I'm poor, <laughs> I think of myself as an artsy guy and it's cool to, to be able to talk to artists. Yeah. And well, some of these. I love talking yeah. to you too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this has been an interesting conversation because you know, we have always been talking about gaining confidence and stuff like that inside the show. So this is quite an interesting topic today. And so you guys, um, if you want to know more about the word, uh, the book hype, the hype, I had the hype handbook. <laughs> I always, you know, I stutter whenever I do interviews. If you want to know <laughs> more right. about the hype handbook, you've got to get it. It's available in all the major bookstores worldwide. Am I correct? Yeah, um, it, it tends to be, even though things are a little weird with uh, the pandemic now. Mm-hmm. And it's definitely available in all the online outlets. I mean, it's on Amazon, it's on any, any of those places. And, you know, if you like going to independent bookstores, which I'm always a big fan of, certainly get them to order it if they don't have it already. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's in all the major places. Yeah. All right. So, wow, this has been an amazing conversation, like I said, and I wish we had more time but before. <laughs> Me I, too. Yeah. <laughs> so before I let you go, do you have any at least piece of advice for our listeners who are struggling about getting more eyes on their work, like building the hype on their own brands and products and artwork? Yeah, it's kind of a meta piece of advice. I would say open your mind to this concept and other new ideas. I mean, I know that sounds self-serving, but I guess what I mean is as a former um, rock and roll guy and artist and, and someone like that, you know, the idea that my art wouldn't stand up on its own merits always troubled me. It was like, my stuff is so groundbreaking that the world will just see it and come to it. And, and I think as artists, we're very prone to being against the idea of marketing, let alone hype. I mean, I hear it all the time. People say, oh, I know I have to promote this stuff, but I feel like I shouldn't have to. It's not my kind of thing. And it's done reluctantly. And if you can open your eyes and mind to the fact that hyping stuff up can not only, is not only essential, but can actually 
add color and fun to the art itself. Because the kind of stuff I'm talking about, you know, Warhol was a great hype artist. David Bowie, Pussy Riot. Um, you know, these people, they didn't draw a line between the hype and the art. It was all part of the same thing. And if you can kind of adapt a playful approach to promoting yourself where it's all part of your art, I, I, that mind shift has really done wonders for a lot of people trying to make their living in the in an artistic sort of world. Yeah, that's that is brilliant. Okay. And like I said earlier, people might be shocked because my type of audience might be new to the words that you have um you have in the book, especially the trigger words that a lot of people will, you know, frown upon immediately, sure. but you have to actually read and get those, the concept and apply it as to how it's, you know, it will become useful, more useful to building the hype that you need for your products, your art, your services, and your brand. Because most of the time, it is on those concepts that we will learn a lot about how we can, you know, use this stuff into our marketing. Like there are different applications and there are different ways to say things and what we want to tell people. But ultimately, you can use all of those things and make it applicable. How can you turn that and make it applicable to your own brand, your own business, your own marketing strategy? You can definitely, definitely use those because I know that because I have done those, some of those myself. Okay, so... You guys get Mike's book. It's called The Hype Handbook and it's available worldwide. All right. So once again, where can our listeners find you, Michael, if uh, and your company and yeah, any other links that we need to know about? Yeah, I mean, the, the uh, oh, there are a lot of, you know, microfamemedia.com is my company. My um, website is michaelfshine.com it's about s c h e i n but but the link i usually give to people so i have this um thing i do which i, I really enjoy called uh the hype book club so i read a lot of books that are not your typical sales and marketing books because i didn't want to learn from you know i read all the marketing books but i wanted to learn from the people who didn't consider themselves marketers as obviously the hype artists, as I call them. So I read all kinds of like biographies of very unusual people and see what lessons I can get out of them, mass psychology books. And the ones that are both the most helpful, but also the most fun to read, I, I uh, every so often I send out recommendations with descriptions um, to something called the Hype Book Club. And it's, it's you know, it's free, of course. And it's um, hypereads.com. And if you go there, not only will you get those recommendations, but it's really, it's become a community. So if you email me back to something I write, if you email me to some, in response to something I've written, I'll absolutely email you back. A lot of people have back and forth conversations with me. So yeah, really, that's the best way to keep in touch with me, hypereads.com. All right. So hypereads.com. And if you didn't cup catch up on all those links they will be in the show notes for sure just head over to mightyleon.com slash michael f shine and you will find everything you need all right and thank you so much michael for being on the show today well thank you oh i should also say because no one gets this right shine is not spelled like shine it's s-c-h-e-i-n so uh, that that confuses a lot of people. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to see you guys get lost out there. Yes, and that is why I asked for the pronunciation. How do I pronounce your surname? So that <laughs> everyone I... says Sheen. It's like, <laughs> is there a Mr. Sheen there? You know, very common. <laughs> so I'm glad to know that I pronounced it right because I asked. You did. Good job. <laughs> nice work. <laughs> All right. So thank you so much once again. And if you like this episode, leave us a review because every time you do, you also help the podcast get discovered by other creatives who need the inspiration to pursue their own creative dreams and as always keep creating and stay confident until next time this is mine